Good afternoon, my name is Leonora Ruffin. Welcome to our 1L orientation. We've been waiting to talk to you for a long time. Thank you for coming. Uh, today we're going to go over some preliminary uh, career development timetables and uh, resources, and then we're going to quickly move to the resume and cover letter uh, portion of our workshop. So a lot of you are familiar with the, our strategy and our mission, and what we really want to try to do is make sure that you have an easy process and that you know what are the steps that you need to take in order to proceed to your 1L summer internship or whatever you're trying to do. We've got things in our office that will give you the resources and the tools, um, but just remember that it's going to be a joint effort. We can continue to say that it's going to be a joint effort in finding uh, work. So, how I'll structure this portion of the talk is basically to say, when you come into our office, the first thing you can expect is that we're going to run a self-assessment. And that means that we're going to try to find out for you, why did you come to law school? What do you want to do here? What are some of your interests and short-term goals? There is already on, in the Career Development Office, which is on this level, um, on our, in our bulletin board, there's a sign-up sheet for you to make individual appointments. And you are assigned career counselors by your last name. So if your last name begins with A through G, I'm going to be your counselor. H through N, Crystal Diesel will be your counselor. And she's right there. Raise your hand, Crystal. I'm right here. Crystal. And Linda Shockland, who's not here tonight, um, is for those of you with last names O through Z. So I can just say this. These are just for starting points. If you find someone else that you'd like to work with or be happy not to get along, <laughs> You can always switch up. There's no problem with that. Now, what do you need to do? The first thing you're going to do is concentrate on the five foundational documents. I say if you have these five things in place, you can run your own job search pretty much for every industry. Resume, cover letter, transcript, writing sample. So when is the, what are the memos due? Aren't you doing a memo right now? 22nd. 22nd. Okay, so that's going to be key. Because a lot of times when you're applying for your first year job, uh, first year summer internship, they're going to ask for a writing sample, and you're probably going to want to give something that you prepared in legal methods. And depending on the timing of it, this document might be the only thing you have a grade for, because I believe you do your appellate briefs next semester. And so if you're getting a head start on applying, you might be using something that you've handed in with this, within this semester. References. We usually ask that you think about having three references. And one should probably be a professor. So whether or not it's from college or law school, someone who can attest to your uh, academic um, skill. Now we're going to have um, workshops for you on practicing your interview skills. And because that's another big component, we dedicate a lot of resources to that. This January. There's a mock interview program that will take place here on campus and around the tri-state area where you'll, be having, you'll have the opportunity to meet with real employers who will want to go through the mock interview sessions with you. It's on a first come, first serve basis, and so you'll want to be looking for information about that. It's going to come out to you probably early January. And sometimes we have alumni to do that, sometimes we have people who are not alums, but it's a wonderful opportunity and it's another place for you to get the individualized coaching that you might want to get before you go into a legal interview. Now, continuing on about what do you need to do, it's really important that you figure out what are the resources that we have uh, for you. I've just pointed out here a couple of resources that sometimes get missed. We have a twin page. so. The one else are in the process of being added to that twin page so that we automatically will enroll you onto that course. But once you're enrolled, you'll be able to access a lot of things there that are password protected. So for example, we'll have um, a job board there that's basically designed to identify every federal agency uh, summer internship in the country. That's one site that we subscribe to and pay for for you. Um, there's another um, ask, ask, um, reference there to the PS Law Net, which is also for public interest jobs. We have, um, if you're interested in judicial clerkships, there are spread, um, Excel spreadsheets of all the local judges that we've already put together for you if you wanted to do a mail merge. Um, various internship opportunities. And there's also a sign-up feature there for the various workshops. 
that we have. We didn't, you didn't utilize it today, but in the future when we have our workshops, you'll be able to sign up in real time and let us know whether you want to attend or not. So look for information about TWIN upcoming. Where do I find the jobs? That's always the question. How many of you did you get your password information already? Good, good. Okay, so we went to your wider your email. If you haven't checked that yet, it probably says something like, welcome to Simplicity Widers um, Job Bank. That's your password and that's your, email, your um, username or in that email. Your username, unless you change it, will always be your Campus Cruiser email address. And so you can always go to the home page uh, of Widers Simplicity site if you forget your password, password and put in that username and you'll have your current password um, set to you. So on the job, in the job date, what will you find? Mostly right now you're going to find positions that are for during the school year. So many of you won't think that that's something that you want to do right now. But as you go on in your studies here, that's actually a very viable option for finding or uh, building your resume and also in uh, finding permanent positions. Towards the early winter, you'll start to see more summer positions uh, advertised through this, the job bank. And the reason for that is that a lot of the employers that we deal with, um, some of the smaller to medium sized firms, some of the public interest agencies, they do a lot more hiring in the spring. And so this is really an early point for them to advertise. There are some exceptions to that, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but you shouldn't be dismayed if you don't see what looks like summer positions on um, the a job bank right now. In addition, a lot of legal employers do not post positions through job boards at all. So part of the process for you is going to be doing um, targeted mailing to employers um, you know, in that, that you think you might want to work with. So for example, if you're interested in small firms that, that do um, employment law, we're, part of our process with you is training you on how to find those employers um, in the tri-state region or wherever you might want to be and helping you write the cover letter, basically a cold, a cold, cold cover letter, um, to entice them to bring you in for an interview. Obviously, networking is a huge part of it um, as well in terms of finding the job. So I, I talked earlier, I think, in, the, in our, your orientation in the summer about hidden job markets. A lot of what you'll be doing is trying to unearth hidden job markets. So it can be a challenging process, but it, you have to get sort of your mindset geared towards that because if you're just looking on job boards, that's not going to be the most effective way to find it, or at least it's just to be one thing that you're doing to find um, jobs. We will host recruitment programs. We just are finishing up our fall recruitment program, which you didn't participate in, but you will come next, next uh, fall. Um, and that's usually something I'm giving you an early heads up on. You're going to get information about that as early as, what did we send it out, June or maybe even before then. Well, you'll have a full recruitment orientation before you leave mm -hmm. um, for the summer. But there again, you're going to be applying for uh, the full recruitment program during the summer. June, the month of July. The, yep, June, and the deadline is usually July 1st. So whatever you do, if you think you might want to apply to the full recruitment program, bookmark this date or save the date somehow because you don't want to miss the recruitment that happens then. We will also have a spring recruitment program which you will be able to participate in and that runs anywhere from February to April. We're pulling in employers, um, it could be a JAG office, it could be some DA um, offices, it could be uh, small firms, it's basically uh, pretty local and whether you're coming on campus to interview with them or applying directly uh, to that organization, it's an opportunity for you to see which employers have identified that they'll need summer uh, work early enough. So usually we will advertise that to you in, starting in January. You're getting ready to go on break and I, so I wanted to mention networking a little bit to you. It may not seem that it will be very effective because if you might say to yourself, right now I don't know many attorneys or the attorneys I know, they, don't, they keep telling me we don't have any jobs, we don't hire um, at all. But I think the key is that you just start to build your network slowly. And what we're going to have for you um, before you even go on break, and you should use the break times um, 
to sort of expand your network is a session on uh, informational interviewing. And that's going to be, you'll see, I have it listed there on the, uh, the handout that has the calendar um, on it. And basically, it's how do you connect with people so that you can start to find out more about their, their practice and at the same time build your network. And it might seem like, well, if I just call someone up, why would they want to talk to me? There are reasons that they may want to talk to you, but the bottom line is that's part of the role that you will play is trying to convince them to talk to you. And that's why we thought it would be important to sort of have a mini workshop on for those of you who might feel a little bit um, unsure about how to do that, um, that you would have some tips on it. So you'll be working on networking all throughout, and particularly, I hope, during this um, break that's coming up. I talked about the targeted mailings or sort of those cold mailings that will be part of um, finding a job. But there's also events on campus. Our hint is you want to be as visible as possible. You should, you'll be receiving uh, information from us about those continuing <coughs> legal education um, classes that they have here where they bring attorneys in all the time. Well, the dean has um, authorized uh, for there to be a reception held after these uh, CLEs so that the students can mingle with the attorneys that are coming here on campus. So moving forward, um, after December 1st, you will be invited to those, and this will be a networking opportunity that will be available to you on campus. It's usually going to be, um, since we can't have a reception for the whole school, it'll usually be 25 or so folks at a time. And usually you wouldn't want to go to every single one because they're very specific. You know, they could be about tax, they could be about compliance. So it'll be based on your interest level, but it is another opportunity to network here locally. On the job fairs, we run a lot of job fairs. We, in the summertime, have um, at least two or three job fairs that uh, this law, law school consortium in this area called GPALS uh, puts together. The most, um, the, the one that's coming up on um, a, a pretty quickly is the Public Interest Public Service Job Fair, and that happens in February. And a lot of what else will participate in this because there's a wide range of different types of employers um, and obviously public interest work uh, covers all different um, practice areas. So probably before Thanksgiving, you'll get an invitation to, to um, apply for that. We're also going to have an info session about a, um, concerning another job fair that's coming up, and that's the Philadelphia Diversity Law Group. Basically, these employers are looking for one else to go into corporate law firms during the summer, and that's, that session is going to be on November 15th at 5 o'clock. So you'll get a specific email about it, but I wanted to give you a heads up. As far as when do you apply, you've got, you should have that long sheet of paper which has the hiring um, guidelines for the various practice areas. If you don't have one, we can get one to you if you came, came late or you didn't, or we don't have enough. Um, but suffice to say, the biggest deadlines you need to be aware of would be that December 1st is the date uh, by which you can start applying for legal positions, okay? Um, if you're an extended division here, this doesn't apply to you at all. You'll note that hiring uh, timelines can vary by field. So, for example, government employers, uh, public interest employers, they hire a lot more in the spring. Smaller firms will hire a lot more in the spring. But if we're talking about wanting to um, join a larger corporate firm, well then they will expect you to send in your information pretty much after December. So we have here um, for large corporate, corporate firm, for those of you who are interested in that, you want to make sure that you probably get an appointment with us so that we can review your resume uh, before you start sending that out. Those are very um, competitive. Um, they're, there have been relatively small number of those jobs available as of late. Um, usually they're looking for the top five to 10% of the class. Um, obviously we're gonna work a little bit on the resume and cover letter now, and hopefully during the holiday break, if you just wanna gauge yourself of when to start, you would um, send out your resumes and cover letters and begin to um, really network more efficiently, I think, um, during the holiday breaks period. Yes? As an EG student, when would uh, uh, I, when, when should I start thinking about internships? Like, when would be a viable time to start? If you have a, would you be available for a summer work full time? Yeah. Yes? So you're not, 
guided by that, you, you, that rule doesn't apply to you, so you could apply, you know, whenever you, you wanted to. Uh, the thing of it is, there are certain key time frames when those employers are looking, and that's why we gave you that sheet, so that you can, even though you can apply now, it might not be the best time depending on where you're looking, but there's no restrictions for you. Same question? Okay. And then, when do you apply? You're going to keep checking our job banks and set up regular times in your schedule to send out these resumes and network and follow up with employers. We're going to be having a <laughs> workshop on a professionally aggressive job search. And that's basically, how do you keep the job search moving in a tough eco economy? We're going to show you how to do that. Pace yourself. Most students will receive the summer offers somewhere between March to June. So if you back that up, they probably have started in earnest applying somewhere around December and January. So obviously the earlier that you start, presumably the quicker you will find employment. And then lastly, <coughs> this is something that I'm glad you're all here and signed up to do this because this I think is a personal investment in your future and it's an opportunity for you to reach your goals and so we're really happy to work with you. Um, I want to turn the program over if there's no questions to Crystal who's going to talk about how to put together a legal resume and cover letter. And bear with me for a few moments because I didn't queue up my video. I didn't have enough time for that. <laughs> Does everyone have all of the, the documents or the extras here? The cover letter one? They're on the back of the floor. Okay. <laughs> Raise your hand if you needed the cover letter. welcome you uh, to the Career Development Office. My name is Krista Diesel. I'm a counselor in the office and there are a total of three of us. So at some point I hope to meet all of you who are assigned to me and even those who would want to work with me who are not assigned to me. I'm more than happy to work with you. Um, who wants to find a job in here? Let's see a raise of side hands. Well that's good because we are here to help you find a job but you have to use us as a resource towards that goal. Um, I know that I talk with a lot of students, 2Ls and 3Ls, and even fourth year students who um, are looking for jobs but don't necessarily know how to do that. Well, that's why we're here. That's why we are here to assist you on how to do that. And building your cover letter and your resume is sort of one step in a very large process that you're going to learn and hopefully engage throughout your time with us because you're not just going to be looking for your first job out of law school but eventually you'll be looking for jobs along the way and you'll be looking for summer internships and externships during the year so we're here to help you with that so um, to get started I hope everybody has a copy of the generic uh, uh, resume and a couple of things just to keep in mind as you start thinking about your resume 
Um, it's basically your first impression that a, a potential employer will have of you. Also think of it as your first writing sample. So if you're handing in a resume to somebody, or to, a, uh, excuse me, to an employer, and you're excited about the job, the last thing that you want to have in there are any typos or anything that sort of detracts from your capabilities and your, um, you know, that first impression that they get of you. Trust me, I've had employers who have contacted us and asked us to take students off of their schedule who may have had a typo in their uh, documents. So, you know, be careful when you're putting these documents together. Proof check them, um, proofread them, grammar check them, exchange them with friends, family, anybody who will read them, as well as bringing them to our office. And we really sort of try to help you make sure that you're putting your best foot forward at all times. So um, one of the things that you'll want to do is establish your experiences and that, um, that they'll show how you add value to a potential um, employer. Um, it's not just about you being the right fit for the employer, but it's also about the company being the right fit for you. So when you're putting together your resume, you want to make sure that you talk about your experiences, <coughs> particularly focusing on your transferable skills. Now, we work with a lot of 1Ls, and 1Ls will say, you know what, I've only ever been a, a lifeguard before, or I've only been a waitress, or I haven't really done anything outside of school. Where there's a lot of things that you can put on your resume that will really showcase those transferable skills. And when I talk about transferable skills, I'm talking about the skills that are going to be useful or important as an attorney. So <clears throat> besides the um, proverbial um, oratory skills, you'll want to have the research and the writing and the ability to talk with clients and the ability to uh, do lots of things that are really going to be important in that job. And so even if you haven't necessarily held a paying job, you may have had other experiences that have some of those transferable skills. So for example, you may have been a president of an organization. And so in that capacity, you certainly had to work with people. You probably had to do some time management. You probably had a lot of skills that are going to be important as an attorney, even though you didn't necessarily get paid for them. Those are things that you can showcase on your resume. So always think about the experience and what are the transferable skills that can be extrapolated, put into a resume, and then showcase to a potential um, employer. In your resume, you'll also want to include a track record of the quality um, quantity in your work product. When I say um, quality and quantity of your work product, I'm not talking about you did X number of documents. But if you were, for example, a salesperson and you increase sales by a certain percentage during your time as a salesperson, you'll want to put that in sort of the resume so that they can show or that you can demonstrate to an employer that you progressively um, got better at your job and also that you were able to produce these um, results that were beneficial to the company. So these are all things that employers are going to be looking for when they're trying to decipher between the hundreds of resumes that they'll get from students. Yes, sir? Do you recommend uh, supplementing your resume with like a LinkedIn account or something like that? Well, we don't have that on our topics to talk about today, but um, the question? Uh, supplementing his resume with a LinkedIn account, so putting your LinkedIn account on there. I. I don't think you necessarily need to do it unless there's some so, sort of overarching reason why you'd want to do that. And we can talk a little bit more about why you might want to include that. I don't think you need to include it. Um, I think your cover letters, I don't know that there's a lot of students who actually put sort of extraneous, um, you know, if an employer wants to look you up, <laughs> all they have to do is type your name in with parentheses and they'll find you. Um, um, with uh, quotes, they'll find you. So I'm not sure that you... I, I'm not sure that I would advocate putting that on your um, account, particularly where there could be a mistake in there, and that sort of sort of detracts from your overall application. Yes. Can your resume should it be only one page? Well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to all of the specific specifics. But yes, your resume should be one page at this point, except where you have a tremendous amount of experience. I know that there are some students who are in the evening division and maybe working full time, or you may have had tons of experience before you decided to come back to law school. In that case, depending on what it is and whether or not a lot of those things are going to be transferable is whether or not you'll have a second page. <coughs> also, um, where um, somebody has a lot of publications, we sometimes encourage them to use a second page to showcase that. But we can talk about if you think that you really want a two-page resume as opposed to not paring it down and thinking about what really do I need on here versus I just can't figure out what to take off. Because let me tell you, if you bring in a two-page resume to me, I'd be happy to cut it down. I've, I've worked with people who have 14-page curric curriculum vitae, and when they left my office, they had one page. So even if you've been working for 20 years, you can get that down to one page based on sort of what you're highlighting. And if you need to have more than one page, 
There's also ways of producing a one-page resume that's specific to a job. So you don't have to have the same resume for every job that you're applying to. You can use different resumes and change out the experiences based on what you're applying for. So um, in addition, you want to state how you are unique from other candidates applying for the same position. Now that can be a little difficult and it can be a little amorphous in, in sort of a resume. But you'll want to include things that are going to be different than sort of other candidates. So a lot of time, one else will include research and writing. But if you ever coordinated or co uh, collaborated or ran or managed or did any of those other sort of active things in the job that you held, you'll sort of want to highlight those because that may set you apart from some of your peers. Um, although, uh, Widener Law students are well accomplished, so it might not. But it's always good to include more rather than less. And if we we will be working with you all individually, so if we get to the point where we feel like something should be added or something should be taken away, we can talk about those in individual meetings. So the resume appearance, to your question, page, it should be one page unless you have significant um, experience that is relevant to the job. Um, you want it to be easily scannable. What does that mean? You want to be able to look at the paper. So if you look at the sample that I handed out, you will see that um, whether it's uh, John Justice's resume or the generic resume, there's lots of white space. So when you look at it, it doesn't look overly voluminous. I know when you were applying to law school or even to your undergraduate programs, you squeeze every possible thing on every single line, and the margins were like slivers, just barely enough to keep it on one page. That is not your goal here. Your goal here is to be precise and concise because those are things that you're going to need as an attorney. So you need to be able to pare this down, be able to articulate it to a potential employer, and be able to show them in a very succinct manner because attorneys are very busy and even their recruiting departments are overwhelmed with the number of resumes that they may be getting. So you want to show them in a very concise manner why they need to hire you and nobody else. So we will help you with that. I will take a pen, a red pen, and, and old school teacher style, cross it out if I think it should be you know, more concise. And all of the counselors in our office are very adept at helping you create a really strong and concise resume. So you want to use active phrases. I've highlighted a couple of those, like collaborates and, and um, articulated or um, coordinated, managed. All of these are action words. And actually, you will be getting a, when you all come to meet with us individually, and I hope you all do, you will get what I call the holy grail of the Career Development Office. It is a book, and everything that you need to know from soup to nuts, from the time that you start here to the time that you're 10 years out, will be in that book. And in that um, career development guide, what's going to be in there are a lot of action words that you can use. So you can make something sound mundane, like I organize papers in the library, sound really exciting and really dynamic if you just use <laughs> and try and, and manage it in a way that sort of showcases some of those um, skills that you were utilizing. Even if, they, even if it was boring and you wanted to rip your eyes out, you can make it sound. Um, being truthful, of course, you can make it sound like there are transferable skills that are definitely applicable to the legal, um, the, the legal um, area that you did while you were doing archiving in a library. Trust me, it can be done. Um, I, this goes without saying, you spell check and grammar check, everything must be perfect. However, spell check and grammar check don't always get it because if you use the word eight, um, A-T-E, and you meant to say E-A-T, they're gonna come up that as, a, I mean, excuse me, not, the number, <laughs> the number eight, E I G H T, and eight A T E will come as uh, come up as correct. So you want to make sure that you check it so that it's in the right sort of context. Because the last thing, like I said, attorneys are very nitpicky, and they will knock you out the box by just having sort of something out of place. Oh, Crystal, one yes. tip for there. One thing I always do, and you'll see me do it when I correct your resume or your cover letter. Read it out loud. If you read something out loud, you can hear the mistakes, uh, and you will probably catch a lot of those um, errors. And this probably goes without saying, but um, use white or off-white bond paper. Pink is real pretty, but it doesn't really help you stand out in a positive way if it comes in resume format. I think there's also a new convention. Let me just finish this one little point, and then I'll get to you. Um, there's a new convention that if you can send it by email, send it by email, it travels quicker, it, it, it's definitely cost effective, and um, it saves a lot of time and energy. So 
Wherever you have an email address, definitely send it by email. The only caveat to that is make sure that, and this goes across the board, whether it's in paper or whether it's in email, you want to make sure that you follow up to make sure that your materials have been received. And we typically <coughs> give, tell you about two weeks is reasonable to follow up just to make sure that your materials have gotten there. Now to your question. Do you recommend that hard bond, quote, unquote, resume paper or is it plain white paper? I think plain white paper is fine. If your resume is really good, they don't care whether it comes you know, in on white paper or bond paper. I think there are some um, older professionals um, who have been you know, practicing long for, I mean, excuse me, law for a really long time who like to see the resume paper. I think it's okay either way. We do have um, some resume paper in our office for you, so if you want to use it, that's perfectly okay. I don't think I come down on either side. I do. You spend the money. Use the bond paper because I think, well, if you're emailing, it doesn't matter. Right. It'll right. be printed off. And I think that's what Crystal's saying is that nowadays people may not get in there. But for judges, for I judges, absolutely. email a judge and they're going to expect to see a nice quality um, presentation. You don't necessarily have to do the folders and all of you know, that, but. I think that is a caveat yeah. that I do think judges, you should send on nice bond paper. And you will be sending judges typically by paper. Most of them won't accept things by email. Right. Um, but I think for most other stuff, because if you keep in mind, you'll be sending out, depending on what you're applying for, because if you're applying to large corporate law firms, you may send out a ton of resumes and get tons of rejections. If you're sending out to, if you're targeted, which we encourage you to be, if you're targeted to sending out to um, you know, fewer small and mid-sized law firm public interest, you're going to be sending out fewer resumes. So after a, a while, you, you've got the postage on all this stuff. So you know, it, it becomes a, a matter of cost effectiveness at some point. And, um, and this may seem like a trivial point, but I have had people try to pass off nine point. Um, I started wearing glasses because it got so small to read some of this print. If your print is all the way down to nine, you need to cut your resume down. Um, your print should really be 11 point, and I highly recommend Times New Roman because you can get a lot in a very small amount of space with Times New Roman in the 11 point. But it should never be smaller than 11 point because it gets really, really tough to read. So we're going to move on to some other things. Resume con uh, content, the first thing and most important thing on the resume is going to be your name followed by your address, contact information. Make sure your contact information is correct. I've had people contact me saying, we really love X, but his information is wrong. Can you please contact him and let us know that we're trying to reach him? So that's pretty embarrassing. Um, you're going to list your law school first and the highlights. So when you look at the sheet, you'll see that uh, Widener Law is going to be listed first. Everything on your resume is going to be reverse, chron if you don't, reverse chronological order if you don't already know that. So you'll list um, Widener, the year you're going to graduate or expected to graduate, and then sort of anything that you're doing thus far. If you aren't doing anything but thus far, and you haven't joined any clubs or anything like that, that's perfectly OK. Um, we just included those so that you can see how to list them on there correctly. Um, GPA, obviously not pertinent for now, because you don't have a GPA. You probably won't have one until January. So um, GPA for undergraduate, if you had a 3.0 or better, we encourage you to list it. And once you get into January and you start applying more uh, in depth, we encourage you if your GPA is a 3.0 or better, include that as well, your wider GPA that is. Um, you can include work experience, volunteer experience. You can um, include leadership positions that you held. Anything that really showcases your ability to, um, you know, to be an individual, also to be a leader, to sort of um, everything that you are, um, you would bring necessarily to that employer. We encourage you to showcase that. Um, emphasize your writing, research, and communication skills from prior experience. Um, and when responding to job ads electronically, this is always sort of that um, innocuous vacuum where you send lots and lots of things out. I don't know if, you, if you've had that experience, but you send things in electronically and you never get a response. You never even know if it got to where it was supposed to go. Well, a lot of those um, programs are actually set up just so that they scan all of the resumes that they receive, particular to a posting, and they look for the buzzwords repeated in those resumes. So one of your tips that we encourage you to do is if you are um, sending something electronically and they have buzzwords in the job description, include those. So if they say managed, or they say collaborated with, or they say do you know Microsoft Word? You want to include those in your resume so that when a computer system is randomly going through and picking out resumes, yours will be one of the ones that are selected. So that's just one of those um, little things that you might have to get used to. 
Um, resume don'ts. Do not include your references. It should be on a separate sheet. Leonora talked a little bit earlier about including three references. I encourage you to list them in the order in which you want them contacted. Sometimes they don't get to the end of that list. Um, and if one should include a professor, I also encourage you to include one from work experience. If you don't have work experience, then we can talk about who else to include. You should not include your Uncle Sam because that's not going to quite work out unless you have actually have done significant and substantial work for him. Um, uh, do not include personal things. I know some people may have been used to doing curriculum vitae, and on those you include a lot of things, including marital status, personal information. I've had seen pictures of people on their curriculum vitae, when they were born, how many children they have. None of that goes on your resume. None of it, none of it, none of it. The only personal information on your resume is going to be your name and your contact information. Um, don't misrepresent your experience. It, um, I think it goes without saying, and I think you um, have been talked a lot too about uh, your professional development and your professional reputation. Well, this is one of those times where you have to exercise restraint. Um, if you, you, you want to be as honest and as forthright um, in your representation. So for example, if you list the language and you say that you are fluent, expect that somebody might start talking to you in Spanish during your interview. I've had students where that has happened. Um, now, it's great if you can start talking back to them in Spanish, but it's horrible if you know three words and then they say, well, you're really not proficient or you're not really fluent, are you? So be honest in your um, experience. And you have a lot of experiences that are going to be valuable, so don't try to oversell yourself because um, attorneys are really good and recruiters are really good at seeing through that as well. So you always want to be your genuine and honest self. Um, so we looked at the sample resume and the... Um, Bible um, <coughs> that we talked about um, a little bit earlier, the book that we're going to give you when you come and see us, and the reason why we hold it back is so that you can actually come and see us, yes. um, we'll have additional samples. But this is a, a, a typical first year uh, law student. Um, generally, I think this is regular division. There are also some examples for extended division, and we have them for all four years in the book as well as online, as well on the twin site. So there's lots of ways to sort of put this all together. Before you come and see us, we encourage you to um, go through your resume and at least, if nothing else, if you take nothing else off, at least set it up in this format because many of you may not already have this format. So enough about resumes, let's talk about uh, cover letters. So moving right along. Uh, some of the stuff that you'll be doing with us over the year, years, will be getting to know yourself, what you're interested in, what you want to do. And so now's a good time to start thinking about those things because you're going to have to articulate to an employer why you are the best candidate. Um, you also want to know your target employer. Why do you want to work for this particular employer? It, it cannot be one size fits all, particularly in an economy where they have lots of applicants and they have a lot of people to choose from. You have to let them know that not only are you a great candidate, but they're the right place for you because you've done all this research and you know exactly why that firm is going to be for you. So you can f do some of the research on websites such as nalp.org, which has some of the largest uh, corporate law firms in the country in there. Martindale.com has sort of everybody else, including the large ones. So getting started, think of it as a marketing tool. Um, I always say avoid mass mailings, except when you are applying to the large corporate law firms because um, the percentage of, of response that you'll get from those is very minimal because um, that's the largest sector that has actually declined over the last couple of years. And they didn't hire a ton of 1Ls. I mean, in any of these programs, they would have maybe one or two 1Ls, and now they've gone down to zero. So I don't want you spending a lot of time personalizing these letters only to get sort of no return on the back end. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying be strategic about it and get sort of in and out and don't spend lots of time. That certainly doesn't hold true for small and mid-sized law, law firms, public interest, government. Those are ones that you're going to spend a little bit more time on. And you're also going to, not going to be applying to as many. So you um, customize each letter when you're applying to the other ones, and you want, it, you want it to look exactly like your resume. So at the top of your cover letter, you're going to have the name, the block. You can essentially take it and copy it from your cover letter. And um, it should look sort of the same exact way. Um, so your first paragraph um, is going to talk about why you're interested in this employer and who you are. Um, if, you if you were referred by a particular person, you'll want to include that as well as the person's name in that particular area. However, keep in mind 
that if you have talked to somebody and they say, sure, use my name in a cover letter, make sure you um, double check with them. Just say, hey, I'm going to be um, sending out letters and I'm going to include your name so that they know they don't get a random call saying, I got a call, I mean, I got a resume from, you know, Jane Doe. And he's like, who's Jane Doe? So just make sure if you're going to use a person as a reference, make sure they know that you're going to use them as a reference and they're okay with that. So one of the second and third paragraphs is where the meat is. It's what can you do for this targeted employer? What are you going to bring to the table? Why should I hire you versus anybody else? And you'll also want to focus on the job requirements to the extent that you have them. If you don't have them, assume that there's going to be research and writing and drafting and just typical sort of first year law things. If you don't know what those are, we'll be happy to talk to you about them. And give some examples from your experience how you've already done that. So, you know, talk about things that you've already done. Again, this is about the transferable skills, what you've already done and how it's going to relate to the job that you'll be able to do for this particular employer. And always refer to your enclosed resume that, as you can see by my attached resume, I've been able to do X and Y. On the sample that we gave out, there's um, the, the sample cover letter, first page, sort of just runs through everything that I've talked about in the second and third paragraphs. And then on the back side, you'll see that Joshua Silverstone has demonstrated all of these um, particular attributes. This is not a time to be a shrieking violet. This is a time to sell yourself, market yourself without going overboard. So showcase your abilities and your talents without um, overselling. So the closing paragraph is always just restating your interest that you are a good fit for the organization, that you can bring a lot of skills and a lot of different things. You want to include your telephone number and your email address even though it's at the top just for convenience in case they don't want to read all the way back up. It's already there for them. And express your desire to meet with them in the future. And also, I always like to include something saying that I'll you know, be in contact with you in two weeks or so to discuss my candidacy. You may never speak to them again. They may never see it, but it's always nice to feel like there's going to be another follow-up step. Um, we've already seen the sample. It's a, um, it's a sample. It was a clapping at the end. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, the next step is always make sure you <laughs> A proofread your resume cover letter, and we encourage all of you to make an appointment with CDL, with a CDO counselor, so that you can go over your cover letter, your resume, and also to strategize about how you would like to sort of move, certain, move forward in your process. Um, and I, last step is always following up with an employer, and the only thing that you need to ask them at that follow-up is, I just contacting you to make sure that you've received my materials, and if there's anything else that I can provide to you as you consider my <coughs> candidacy, is sort of your standard follow-up language. Um, so I'm looking forward to meeting with all of you and working with you over the next couple of years, and I hope that you will all make an appointment. Sign up on the bulletin board. The sheets are outside on our bulletin board, and I look forward to meeting you all. Thank you so Thank much you for your much. time. Thank you.